climate change is no longer a distant threat. It is already shaping the present and threatening our path to a sustainable future. But there's hope. Climate action, when taken seriously, can help us achieve sustainable development and protect the most vulnerable among us. In this video, we're going to explore topic three of the climate cluster, focusing our attention on how climate action works, the strategies involved, and how it varies across different places. Are you ready? Let's begin. Climate action refers to stepped up efforts to combat climate change and its impacts. It includes two key strategies, mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation focuses on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and enhancing carbon sinks. This means slowing down the rate of climate change. Adaptation, on the other hand, involves adjusting to the effects of climate change to reduce harm to people, properties, and the environment. Both strategies are complementary. Mitigation prevents future problems by reducing the cause of climate change, while adaptation addresses the present by reducing harm caused by ongoing climate-related changes. If we only mitigate without adapting, we ignore the effects already happening. If we only adapt without mitigating, the problem worsens. Therefore, they must be implemented together to build community resilience, which enables societies to withstand, absorb, and recover from climate-related impacts while continuing to develop sustainably. There's a lot to unpack, so let's begin by making sense of why climate change is a threat multiplier. Climate change doesn't act alone. It amplifies existing challenges in natural and human systems. Take coral bleaching, for instance. Extensive ocean pollution and improper fishing methods have already been damaging coral reefs. Coupled with climate change, the rise of global sea temperatures and ocean acidification will occur. This worsens the extent and rate of coral bleaching, ultimately threatening ecosystems that support fisheries and coastal communities. Such consequence can multiply into a series of long-term economic and social challenges. Another example would be in the Sahel region of Africa. Prolonged droughts caused by deforestation and now intensified by climate change have reduced cereal production by up to 13%. This has deepened poverty amongst the local populations and threatened their food security. What's important to understand is that climate change doesn't create problems in isolation. It interacts with existing socioeconomic issues, making them harder to manage. Places already burdened with deforestation, weak infrastructure, or high food insecurity feel the impacts of climate change more acutely. Therefore, we say climate change multiplies existing threats. Now, this leads us naturally to the next point. Climate change does not affect all places equally. It constrains development paths, especially in developing countries. Climate change limits the ability of both current and future generations to meet their own needs. In many developing countries, funds are redirected from essential development goals, such as education or healthcare, to post-disaster recovery. This is especially problematic in regions where development is most urgently needed. Repeated disruptions not only erode existing gains, such as poverty reduction, but also trap communities in cycles of vulnerability. Climate change becomes a barrier to achieving long-term sustainable development. This reinforces the need for climate action that is context-specific and inclusive, taking into account the unique challenges faced by different communities. Now, let's unpack mitigation strategies that could be implemented to reduce the causes of climate change. They include 1. International agreements and cooperation. The UNFCCC and the signing of international treaties such as the Paris Agreement aim to stabilize emissions globally. Developed nations are expected to take the lead, support developing countries, and monitor progress. However, enforcement remains a challenge since commitments are not legally binding. 2. The introduction of low-carbon technologies. Innovations like carbon capture, utilization, and storage CCUS, reduce extensive amounts of carbon dioxide from entering the atmosphere. While effective, these technologies are expensive and still under development. 3. Utilizing clean energy sources. Solar, hydro, nuclear, and geothermal energy reduce dependence on fossil fuels. Yet, transitioning requires large financial investments. For instance, in 2019, solar power accounted for just 1.7% of Indonesia's total electricity generation. This is a reflection of the high installation costs and limited infrastructure to support large-scale solar adoption. In fact, many countries struggle to scale their renewable energy sector, 
and continue to remain reliant on fossil fuels. Four, changes in consumption patterns. Choosing local and plant-based foods, reducing food waste, and minimizing plastic and fast fashion consumption can all reduce greenhouse gas emissions. However, shifting behavior is often slow due to entrenched social habits and economic interests. Five, enhancing carbon sinks. Forests and oceans absorb carbon dioxide, it is vital to protect and regenerate these natural sinks through afforestation, reforestation, and restoration of mangroves. But land use competition and economic dependencies on deforestation, like palm oil in Indonesia, pose significant challenges. In conclusion, mitigation strategies are essential for addressing the root causes of climate change, but no single mitigation effort works in isolation in reality. Their effectiveness depends on factors like political will, financial capacity, technological readiness, and public support. Next, adaptation strategies can be employed to help communities adjust to and manage the effects of climate change. These include 1. Structural approaches. These involve physical infrastructure like seawalls, polders, and water storage tanks. In Singapore, the Stamford Detention Tank prevents floods by managing excess stormwater. However, structural approaches may not be suitable for all countries, as they are often expensive to construct and maintain, and they may also result in the displacement of informal communities. 2. Technological Approaches High-tech farms ensure food security by producing more food, despite environmental constraints such as limited land or unfavorable climatic conditions. Singapore's 30 by 30 plan is one example, but such technology is costly and may not be feasible in all countries. 3. Social Approaches Through education campaigns and workshops, as well as media outreach, individuals will develop increased awareness to make climate-resilient decisions while building community preparedness. For instance, farmers in Nepal are trained to grow drought-resistant crops, which improves agricultural resilience. In Singapore, public advisories on heat waves and educational campaigns on flash floods guide residents on safety protocols. However, these approaches require time, consistency, and community buy-in. Behavioral change is gradual and often influenced by cultural norms and trust in authorities. 4. Institutional Approaches National and regional governments play a key role in helping communities adjust to and manage the effects of climate change. In Singapore, the Ministry of Sustainability and the Center for Climate Research lead climate resilience efforts. Regional cooperation, such as through ASEAN, helps align climate strategies across countries. However, funding constraints and competing national priorities may limit effectiveness. So, why does all this matter? Topic 3 isn't just about memorizing strategies or listing risks. It's about understanding the why, the how, and the impact of climate change on communities, economies, and ecosystems, especially in unequal ways. We began by understanding climate change as a threat multiplier. This means that climate change doesn't just add one more problem to the mix, it intensifies existing vulnerabilities. From worsening droughts in food insecure areas to pushing poor coastal communities closer to climate tipping points, it creates compound threats that disproportionately affect the most disadvantaged. This leads us to why development paths are constrained. Countries that are already struggling with poverty, lack of infrastructure, or debt now also face rising costs due to climate-related damage. This diverts funds away from long-term progress, like building schools or roads, towards rebuilding from floods or cyclones. When this happens repeatedly, it hinders sustainable development. But here's where you, the learner, gain agency. We looked at two powerful forms of climate action. Mitigation strategies help to slow climate change, whether it's switching to solar power, reducing plastic use, or protecting forests to act as carbon sinks. Adaptation strategies help us cope with the impacts that are already here, from seawalls at East Coast Park to high-tech farms feeding Singapore despite limited land. Yet, no strategy is perfect. Each comes with trade-offs, economic, technological, or social. Whether it's the cost of renewable energy or the challenges of changing consumption habits, what's clear? is that solutions must be context-specific and community-driven. As a geography learner, your task is to think critically about how strategies play out differently across places, link ideas, and evaluate with empathy. For example, to recognize that developing countries may lack the resources that wealthier nations take for granted. 
And remember, the ultimate goal of this topic is not just to describe or explain. It is to assess how climate action supports sustainable development. If this video helped you better understand topic three of Climate Cluster, do give this a thumbs up, share this with your classmates, and don't forget to subscribe for more geography deep dives. Do visit thatgeographyteacher.com to access resources such as learning guides and exam strategies tailored to the Singapore syllabus. Have fun learning and see you in the next video.